Hello, welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today's date is uh, 2nd of April 2014. This is Truth Sentinel, just to remind you, you can subscribe uh, by clicking on the subscribe button on the uh, Truth Sentinel YouTube channel. You can also go to our Scott Sentinel Facebook page, contact us there and um, send us any messages about topics you'd like us to cover on the show. You can also leave messages underneath the videos and um, I look at all of them and uh, if you've got any suggestions for topics then we'll try to cover them. I'm just going to make a quick appeal for um, guests, any guests and people that want to come on the program. Um, please contact us by clicking on the uh, email button on the YouTube channel or go to Facebook, join us on there and let us know about a topic you'd like to talk about if you're an authority. Also we're going to do a Skype in so if you're just a listener and you just want to talk about a topic and just give your opinion contact us too because I'm going to put a collage together of, uh, of listeners that have uh, contacted me and we've spoken on Skype. We'll have a couple of minutes each. We'll put them all together and then um, we can uh, say hello to our first listeners. So uh, if you'd like to get involved with the Skype in, just contact me via Facebook or um, the channel, okay? Also, we're looking for a re reviewer, someone who can do reviews of other shows, just have a, sl a regular slot. Um, so if you're interested in doing reviews of other shows like Alex Jones, um, Lip TV, uh, Coast to Coast, Caravan to Midnight, we need someone to listen to those shows regularly and just pick out interesting ones that you've heard or new new upcoming shows. And um, so we need someone to do that. We're trying to get as many people as involved as possible with this channel. Okay. Um, Today's news, flight uh, MH370 still missing, seems to be starting to quieten down now um, and they still haven't found any, anything in the ocean completely identifying it to that flight and we'll talk more about that later. Russian troops have partly withdrawn uh, from the Ukrainian border or they haven't depending on, on what you read. Uh, the Daily Mail says this possible partial withdrawal is because they've been stung by sanctions from the West. That's great unbiased reporting there. NATO is said to be cutting ties of cooperation with Russia so that should uh, that should scare Putin and I'm sure he'll um, he'll say sorry and everything will be fine. The Ukrainian parliament has ordered neo-Nazi right sector to lay down their weapons and get out of Kiev. Um, I only hope that that doesn't include any normal protesters there because, I mean, you know, the protests in um, in Kiev, were, uh, the hundreds of thousands of people who turned up there, they weren't all Nazis or fascists. Um, but, you know, there were some there, that's for sure. And uh, so if they've been kicked out of or being kicked out of Kiev, Kiev that's a good thing. The Daily Mail newspaper... Um, has been boasting about how a British sniper killed six um, insurgents with a single shot due to one of them wearing an explosive vest. It's almost like they were saying, well done, what a great shot. You killed six people with one shot. Um, credit to the Daily Mail, though occasionally they have someone who at least brings something to people's attention, like the uh, the new Cinderella law. Um, which is being proposed to protect children, which is a good thing. Uh, protecting them from emotional cruelty, that's great too. But parents could potentially be imprisoned on the say-so of their children if they're found to be not displaying an, um, enough love and neglecting them. So if they're found to be unloving, they could potentially go to prison. Now, there's obviously concern there. Um, there's already cases of children suing parents. Um, I read about one of those recently in uh, the USA. But this basically means you can be imprisoned if you're seen to be neglecting your child. And I think that's going to be really hard to define. Um, 
but I think it'll, if it does come in into place, then then basically you're going to get neighbours spying on uh, on each other and um, children reporting their own parents to the police. Um, you know, it could lead to a nightmare scenario. Uh, sometimes things that are brought in for good intentions can just escalate and then, you know, 10, 20 years go past and then before you know it, um, street cameras are picking out neglected children, parents are going to prison. Um, military dr drones, they could be used to take out uh, parents who aren't showing enough love. I'm exaggerating slightly, but who knows? <laughs> Um, there's already military drones over our skies at the moment. Well, there's at least one. The BBC have reported that. Um, that's admitted by the military anyway. So I think I think it basically that's a test case. See how the public react. And at the moment, I've I've seen very little reaction in the press regarding that military drone that's now flying over the UK. Most people seem to think it's fine because we have a a loving, caring government that would never harm us, of course. North and South Korea have been displaying their military might this week. Um, so if Ukraine and Syria doesn't cause World War Three, then um, the powers that be have always got the, uh, the North-South Korea thing to fall back on. The media continue to kind of vilify North Korea instead of someone taking the threat seriously, sitting down with the leaders over there, trying to make things better, and if not, arresting them. Uh, and trying, trying, um, trying them in a criminal court because that situation is going to, in the future, turn into something pretty bad unless someone takes it seriously and stops mocking the North Korean government. There's been a, there's been a big increase in the amount of fear being projected this week in the newspaper and on TV, especially in regard to uh, climate change. I mean, climate change apparently is at apocalyptic proportions now. We're all basically going to die. Um, also, uh, you know, there, there's lots of scare stories this week. Eating chocolate, the Daily Mail says, can give you an asthma attack. You can die from that. Um, also, talking about dreams in the Daily Mail, nightmares you have in the night probably mean you'll have an underlying illness. So you should insure yourself against everything as it's all probably going to happen. Um, health news, well, um, apparently five a day isn't enough anymore. You need to take seven a day, otherwise you're going to die much younger. Five, five years from now, they'll just say you need to just constantly munch on modified crops, otherwise you're going to die. Trusting the police in the UK is an all-time low, according to a UK watchdog. Um, Her Majesty's Chief Inspectors of Constabulary. Um, that's due to things like the um, the Lawrence case and um, you know allegations of spying on f on the family in that case, but also in just so many other instances where people have lost trust in the police, and that's happening abroad too. I mean, I've seen lots of cases in the USA which are quite shocking. The Facebook drinking craze is also killing killing everyone. That's been reported a lot. Um, don't let your children use the internet, basically. Seems to be the news that's coming out of a lot of newspapers. The news this week, um, Putin called Obama and they had a cosy little chat discussing a nice diplomatic end to the whole crisis. And Jory, John Kerry's been involved with that too. And they're all sorting it out behind the scenes. I don't believe it anymore, to be honest. This is what we're shown in the media, but I just, I don't think this is what is actually happening. Um... So, you know, these hour-long phone calls they keep talking about, I don't really think they're, they're really having serious conversations about the things we think they are. I'd love to, I, I hope WikiLeaks sometime, somehow gets hold of one of those conversations, because I think everyone would get a big shock as about what they really are talking about. Okay, so I'm um, just talking about the, um, the flight MH370. Um, there was a picture of something white floating in the sea. We've seen a lot of those pictures and they're, they're all being brought back for analysis. Um, but I think, you know, 
it all sounds very technical, but I think the analysis will be, what the hell is that? It's a blob. I can't make out what it is. Can, can you get it out of the water? And then they'll try and go and find it, and obviously it's not there, or they can't find it anymore. It's all a very, uh, very weird technology we have these days. It seems to have gone very backward. Um, just blobs now from satellites. Not, not been able to read a newspaper like we were told in the 70s. We can only, we can only take pictures of blobs. So there's no way we could find a plane now. We can just only search blindly around. Um, last episode we talked about flight MH370. We talked about Ukraine and we were... We had our um, two Ukrainians who came on and from different region, regions and gave their their opinions of what was happening. Um, we're going to continue uh, talking about uh, MH370 today and lots of other topics. And first we're going to have a break and then uh, we'll continue after that. Hi, welcome back to Truth Sentinel. Just had a tea break there. Um... Firstly, I'm just going to, um, before I move on to the main content, going to talk about um, anything that I see in the comments section that um, that people have mentioned that I pick out maybe each week. Uh, this time I saw um, someone talked about population control. Do the globalists have a point? If there is an idea to cut down the population severely, is that maybe something that we sh that should be considered? I'll just make a few comments on that and then we'll move on to the main content. I mean, I'll, I'll give my opinion. Personally, I think we, there's plenty of land mass around. We've got plenty of land uh, on Earth to for for a much larger population. I mean, there's, there's desert areas, there's, there's Australia, has got massive land masses that are unused. Maybe we could develop technology where um, we can start habit inhabiting um, hotter regions um, by creating air-cooled homes, for example. So I don't think it's a problem of land mass. Maybe it's more a problem of resources like water, food. But I, I actually think that's to do with the way we, the, our societies run rather than too many people. I think there's plenty of room for the population to grow. It's just the fact that we've decided to go down the route of um, that we have. You know, if, if we went back to living off the land, everyone looking after themselves or buying locally from farmers, then I think um, that I think there wouldn't be a problem. It's the fact that where that we've gone down this route of having to buy everything like water, gas, electricity, um, buying all our products from supermarkets. Um, let me know what you think anyway. Do you think we should depopulate the planet? And uh, if so, who's going to volunteer? That's what I want to know. I mean, when I hear uh, people from the royal family talking about it, it seems to come from a very superior point of view. Um, I think I think we've got plenty of time, and we can to think about this and think about ways we can cut the population down. We certainly don't need to cull the population, which um, some people believe the globalists do intend to do at some point. Um, well, um, at the moment, we're legislating people out of their homes as well. The cost of housing has made it impossible for most people to buy a home, especially in the UK. Um, let us know what it's like in your region of the world. Like I think I mentioned last episode, you can't just put up a tent anywhere and live where you want to. So housing is a major problem for the population, but only because of the society we live in. Why, why couldn't couldn't we just put up a tent where we like or we you know there should be guidelines but there's you know I don't I don't think you can put up a tent almost anywhere in England without someone bothering you um, and I don't think legally you can do it anyway and yet there are there are regions in the countryside where you definitely wouldn't be bothering someone so you I think you should just be allowed to do it it should be legal to do it and there should be much cheaper alternative homes for people to live in you don't you know, a lot of people would be quite happy to live in a fairly, fairly basic house. They just don't want to pay two hundred, three hundred thousand pounds, which is what it costs um, for the absolute bare minimum in London these days. Um, what else can we talk about? I mean, one thing I did notice: um, they're they're starting to introduce small little pods in airports which I've always thought someone should do I've never understood why everyone has to sleep on the floor at airports 
seems to be a problem that's been ignored for years and years. Why can't they just make those kind of Japanese Japanese style pods for people to crash in at airports? Because um, you know, it'd be so much more comfortable. It's almost like they want people to to sleep in agonising pain. Anyway, I've saw um, I saw an article where they had built some really nice, cosy little small pods. You actually had room for a bed in there and a, a little bit of room to walk around. It had Wi-Fi and everything. Now, I think those kind of things should be available. Um, they, they could build whole communities of those pods. I mean, not, that wouldn't be to everyone's taste. If you want to live in a big mansion, fine, go and live there. If you're happy to live in a very small pod, it doesn't cost almost negligible cost, then you should be allowed to do so. And um, I, I, for one, would probably be happy with that, to be honest. You know, you could have different size pods. You know, if, if you start to if do well in your job, you can upgrade to a bigger one, you know. Let me know your ideas anyway, how to how to combat the growing population. If the population needs to be controlled, um, it sh definitely shouldn't be by um, allowing people to die from diseases like uh, cancer, malaria, um, and all the other diseases that are killing people en masse, and which I think there are cures for, um, but people aren't tackling the problem because, number one, pharmaceutical companies are making too much ma money out of it, and um, so there's no there's no uh, no reason for them to try to find a cure. And number two, I think they actually would prefer that people do die off. They don't want to actually increase the population. I think it's more about um, quality rather than quantity, you know. We need less stupid people, less racist people, less violent people, less murderers, less intolerant people. And um, so maybe people should lose the right to breed if they're murderers, violent or militant racists. Or, or if they're extremely stupid. And I don't mean... The, I mean... I mean stupidi stupidity that makes them harmful to other people. I don't mean people that are, are just born maybe less intellectually gifted. Good, good, decent people could just be encouraged to breed. Um, everyone knows um, nice guys come last and, um, and women attracted more to bad guys. Uh, but it'd be nice to encourage encourage decent people uh, to breed more. So, uh, you know, basically people like, um, I read about that Night Stalker, I think it was called, Ramirez, the guy in the States who uh, who used to kill people in front of their husbands or wives. Um, he's had more offers of marriage than the average decent guy. So uh, it, it just doesn't seem like our societies actually run to encourage uh, decent people. It seems like there's something in humanity at the moment which is rewarding um, bad people, basically. Murderers, um, intolerant people, racists, uh, violent people. And we need to find out what it is and try to change that. Let me know what you think about that. Let's move on to Flight MH370, the continuing saga. There seems to be so many changes, um, like recently there was changes in the story of the last words from the pilot, that's changed. Now everything was fine and the previous information was incorrect. When he said good night, um, we were told previously, or it was reported, that you know the way that, that was said, that was slightly out of character and would, wouldn't normally be said. Now we're being told, no, he actually didn't actually say that in that order, that's changed, everything's fine. Families are questioning what's what's being reported on and what they're being told. They're saying they're being lied to. I think they probably are. Air traffic control transcript will not be released as it's secret, apparently. I think there's too many secrets uh, in the world at the moment. I think we need to have a much more open society. A lot of other data is not being released according to some scientists. It's all becoming kind of quite laughable, but... Um, the way it's being run, the information on this flight disappearance, but it's obviously not laughable, it's quite tragic. There seems to be a lot of erratic reactions going on. If it's a cover-up, it's taking a lot of time to cover up what's really happened. Um, 
one good thing about cover-ups is um, it makes it a lot easier. Um, so they can very easily rely on the conspiracy nut uh, label to get away, get away with whatever they want. Society is kind of implicit in, in allowing cover-ups to occur because people are so um, so quick to label everything as conspiracy if you disagree with what the main story is in the news. And we'll be talking about one of the conspiracies today. I mean, I, I've, I've heard there's conspiracies about uh, was something in the cargo hold or was there a passenger on board that could lead us to some clues as to what's happened. About a week ago, I read about Diego Garcia. Have you read about that? Um, there's an island in the Indian Ocean that's some kind of secret military base and there was talk of uh, the possibility the missing plane had landed there. I've kept an open mind, as I, as I try to do, about any kind of conspiracy theory or any piece of news, uh, however crazy it may seem. Just keep an open mind, I say. Uh, but it, when, when, I th when I thought of the plane landing there and then managing to be able to keep people quiet, all the passengers, it didn't seem very credible. Um, but as new snippets, snippets of information come through on the Diego Garcia Island, I feel it does warrant some attention. As mentioned before, um, we don't, I don't, or we don't believe any old conspiracy, but we don't laugh at them, we investigate them, hold on to some, discard others. There's so many things about this flight that don't really seem to sit well with me anyway. How do you feel about it? Mainstream news are still talking about possible fires on board and other possibilities that just don't seem to tie in with what we've been told. I mean, if there was a fire on board, then how did the plane fly on for another five hours? Um, and why did everything coincidentally go wrong immediately after leaving Malaysian airspace? I mean, I heard that the transponder was off within two minutes of changing, um, changing to another airspace. Also, I've heard I've heard so many uh, other bits of information which seemed quite credible. Like there was one pilot who doesn't want to be named, saying that he was requested by ground control to make contact with flight MH370 fairly soon after it disappeared, which would make sense because you know there's air traffic controllers tracking each plane when it's handed over to another airspace. I can't believe that. That's it. If a plane disappears, that's it. Nobody even bothers mentioning anything. They would have noticed it fairly quickly. And um, it seems credible they might ask a pilot if they'd had problems contacting it. So anyway, they apparently asked a pilot to try to make contact. And this pilot says that he did make contact with the flight. And that there was a response, but they couldn't hear them very well. Um, anyway... That's just I'm just telling you what I've uh, been reading on the uh, on the internet. You can check out a lot of this stuff yourself, obviously. Anyway, it seems that most media have accepted the fact that the planes crashed into the Indio Indian Ocean, and you know the, the Malaysian Airlines very quickly said that that was the case, which just seemed very bizarre the way they did it. They just suddenly announced, yep, it's crashed. They're all probably dead. Um, and, and it just seems a bit, it seemed a bit strange to me. Um, and then they started releasing satellite images, uh, which were very blurred. And it just, that doesn't make sense either. We're supposed to have satellites that can read newspapers from space, as I mentioned before. And then we get these blobs. Doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I think sometimes we're going to have to speculate on this one because there's just not enough information about what's really happening. But as with a lot of stories, when things don't make sense, it means there's something going on, or, they, or you're not. Be, we're not being told the truth. And should we be told the truth? I think we should. You know, a lot of us fly. I fly a lot. I don't want to. I don't want to um, be under the impression that I can get on a plane fly somewhere, go into another airspace, and then just disappear and never be found again. Um, so I want answers personally, and I know I know a lot, most people do. So let's find out a bit more about Diego Garcia. 
um, our resident academic from the University of Bill Kent. I've asked him to do a little bit of research on Diego Garcia to tell us um, basically a little bit more information about that island. So, um, hi Anthony, thanks for joining us again. Hello, it's nice to be here. First of all, uh, Turkey, how did the elections go there? Yeah, it's been an interesting couple of days. Um, the uh, balcony speech given by the Prime Minister was very interesting because this was not actually an election to elect a new Prime Minister. This was uh, an election to um, choose regional leaders who end up in the national parliament. So, uh, but he's, he's given what essentially amounts to a victory speech. Mm. And... Um, and it's quite an extraordinary speech. I mean, he's gone so far as to uh, as to make a claim against some Syrian territory, and announce that the Syrians are at war with Turkey, and therefore the opposition should all shut up and leave the country. <laughs> right, and they um they recently shot down a uh, Syrian jet as well, didn't they? Yeah, this is only about a week ago. Um, it it. it strayed about a kilometer into Turkish territory and they just shot it down. They apparently did send a couple of warning uh, messages and the Syrian jet was involved in, uh, in chasing some rebels in a mountain area uh, and Turkey supports the rebels. So there was that, but uh, one kilometer into Turkish airspace and phew, into the side of a mountain. So this government is not messing about at the moment. And um, have you heard? Have you um, heard any of your students uh, commenting on any events in Turkey recently? Any of the you know events like the Syrian jet being shot down and the uh, the speech? The Syrian jet hasn't been commented on. Uh, there was a real mood of despondency yesterday uh, at our university, and, I, and I've said before, our university is, I guess, more conservative than most, uh, at least most of those in Ankara. But there was a there was a definite mood of, of despondency here. Um, the election was really one that was marred by by fraud, and a certain amount of that was expected. But it went a lot further than people were expecting. Um, there were fake names uh, being created and adding to electoral electoral rolls. There were bags of ballot papers. Uh, that had been uh, filled in uh, that turned up before the voting had started. There were all kinds of stuff, as well as some clashes. Like you might have heard uh, nine or ten people lost their lives in gun battles in the provinces outside polling stations. No, I didn't actually hear that. Yeah, so it's been a it's been an intense uh, an intense election, and really, I don't think that. We can. I don't think it's possible to say right now who actually won because of the degree of fraud that, that's happened. Right. And do you think there's going to be any, um, any other events occurring in Turkey um, as a result of these elections? I don't know. There were some protests today in Ankara. Ankara has turned out to be the, the epicenter, I would say, of the protest movement. And, uh, yeah, the usual thing, students turned up, started to protest, police turned up with massive trucks with water cannons loaded on the top. These uh, trucks with the water cannons are, are parked in the central squares permanently, by the way. Mm -hmm. They're just there all the time in case, you know, anybody gets out of line and just, you know, uh, turn the ignition on and, and, and get the water cannons running. <laughs> yeah. Interesting situation. Yeah, keep. Um, it's good that you're in the epicenter there. You can keep us up to date if anything does occur. Well, that's almost the only interesting thing that ever happens in Ankara. So. <laughs> okay, now um, you, you kindly agreed to do some research for us um, on a regular basis. You're now our resident academic researcher. Um, what have you come up with this week for us? I've been looking into uh, one of the theories surrounding the uh, disappeared Malaysian Airlines flight. Um, and as you know, there have been a ton of these theories. But I think there's one in particular that, that seems, to, uh, seems to ring true in some ways, at least. It's, it's very speculative, but uh, the theory uh, 
which was originally put forward by a, a blogger called Jim Stone, a freelance journalist. Uh, the theory is that the flight landed on the island of Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you look into Diego Garcia a little bit, the situation gets a bit more interesting. So the uh, the reason why it would, would have landed there, if that's what happened, is that there is a U.S. military base there. But uh, the base hasn't always been there, and it's not your typical you know, camp of bomb steel or whatever. There's, there's, there seems to be something going on there. Um, it's, for isn't start, it some kind of secret military base? It's not a secret that there's a military base there, but, but what has actually been going on there is the subject of some speculation and controversy. Uh, just to situate it a little bit, it's actually... Um, it's at the southern tip of a very long chain of islands in the Indian Ocean. There's a ridge in the Indian Ocean, and that ridge has thrown up a lot of coral islands, and Diego Garcia is one of the southernmost. In that group of islands, you've got the Maldives and Mauritius and so on. Um, and Mauritius used to have sovereignty over uh, Diego Garcia, but it sold the sovereignty to the UK in 1965. <laughs> mm-hmm. The UK then proceeded to lease the island to the US, uh, but the terms of the lease stipulated that the island should be unpopulated, which it wasn't. So the British Labour government of the time uh, forcibly deported the entire population. That's nice of them, isn't it? It is. And I mean, this is something that we've, you know, we've all heard about. Um, we've, we've heard about this kind of thing happening you know, in Stalinist Russia, for example, in the 30s and 40s. But the British doing it in the 70s, that, that is quite amazing. Um, since they were deported, uh, the locals, they're called Chagossians. Uh, the Chagossians have been fighting to be repatriated. Um, and they've been engaged in a struggle with the, with the British government that's been going on approximately as long as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict now. I tell you what, I've seen, um, I've seen photos of this island and I've actually got a friend who um, has been to the island. Who mm-hmm. I'm trying to get to come on the program, but I'm not sure if that's going to happen yet. Um, but it's, by all accounts, it looks like complete paradise. So if I was evicted from that island, I think I'd be pretty uh, fed up as well. Yeah, and a lot of these, uh, a lot of the locals were were evicted to Mauritius, which is also in theory a tropical island. But but they were stuffed into a slum in a city called Port Louis, and they're they're not happy, understandably. Mm. Um, but really, uh, this mass deportation, although it was only to seal a deal, um, it's. It's really called uh, a lot of things into question. So, so in 2010, it, it came up again uh, because the legal authorities that are trying to repatriate the Chagossians to Diego Garcia seem to be making some progress. And the British government uh, suddenly announced in 2010 that it was going to create a marine protected area around most of the archipelago of which Diego Garcia is a part. Now, this would be one of the largest marine protected areas in the world, and it would mean that there would be no oil and gas exploration, no commercial fishing, no extractive industry of any kind, and that there would be limitations on who could visit the island. Probably limitations like uh, nobody can visit. Yeah, pretty much. Well, I mean... um, I like like the way that sometimes um, governments do that, and, and conservationists too. It's like, this place is so beautiful, no one's actually allowed to come and see it. Yeah, but I mean, there was when this when this thing happened. I mean, why why are they declaring a marine protected area around this island? You know, um, there were immediately questions as to as to why they would suddenly do that. I mean, it's occupied by a U.S. military base, mm. so <laughs> it's not the ideal place to declare a marine protected area. Um, and in uh, April two thousand and ten, do you remember the Cablegate scandal? Um, you're our researcher, Anthony, so please uh, inform me. <laughs> okay, so so a bunch of cables, uh, diplomatic cables, were outed, uh, and one of those... Was that, uh, was that with, uh, to do with WikiLeaks? Or, or I believe it was connected with WikiLeaks, yeah, and, and uh, 
One of the cables was a conversation between a British and an American official about this marine park. Basically, the American diplomat said, if we can get this marine protected area up and running, the natives will go away permanently and we can continue doing what we like on the island. Hmm. Uh, now, the what we like is, is the big question. Um, there's a bunch of military stuff happening there. And officially, um, it's a United States Navy support facility. Uh, it's a large submarine support base. There's a military air base there. There's a communications and space tracking facility. Uh, it's an anchorage point for, for military supplies that are pre-positioned. So if there are any big military operations in the region, say, for example, if the conflict between Taiwan and mainland China blew up, Diego Garcia would be one of the places that the U.S. would base. It's, uh, it's I, I know that I know that that's true because my my contact um, it was in the military and he actually um, was involved with submarine technology and also flying from um, Diego Garcia uh, during the Iraq War. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So they actually do fly sorties from there as well. To... They do, it seems. Yeah, I mean there have been satellite photos showing stealth bombers there, B fifty twos, all kinds of things over the years. And I believe um, they have a lot of um, they have a satellite monitoring um, facility there as well. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, but in reality, there's a lot more potentially going on there than just a military base. So, for example, uh, in 2003, uh, there was a journalist, uh, British journalist, Mark Seddon. He reported on a newly created facility there called Camp Justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, the comparison was to Camp X-Ray in Guantanamo Bay. And around that time, you might remember the Bush administration had started uh, this devious little little operation that they called Extraordinary Rendition, which is where you, uh, you capture somebody in combat or in general <laughs> who you'd quite like to interrogate. But then you, you give that person to another country to do the interrogation for you. And uh, the advantage of, of doing that is that the other country might have more relaxed rules than your country when it comes to things like torture during interrogation, things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I've heard a lot about that. That's perfectly fine, though, Anthony. I hope you're not suggesting this is this is wrong of our governments to do that. Well, I I wouldn't ordinarily say such an important thing, but when you look at the places these people were rendered to, I mean, you're talking about countries like Yemen, uh, Syria, which, funnily enough, was an ally back then, uh, Uzbekistan. So they were sending, they were capturing these guys in Afghanistan, for example, and sending them off to the Uzbeks. Now, if you take Uzbekistan as the example, I mean, there you've got uh, Islam Karimov, who, who took over the country when it split off from the USSR in the early 90s. And that guy, he's essentially a dictator. Um, and he's, I mean, one of his hobbies, <laughs> one, of, one of the things he's known for is boiling his enemies alive. His political I've, I've been looking for a new hobby. That's, uh, that's yeah. given me some ideas. Me too. <laughs> so, you know, in other former Soviets, you've got, you know, people like the, the people in the mold of Putin and Yanukovych, you know, trying to slip a bit of polonium into your tea if you don't like them. Mm. But uh, Karimov doesn't mess about with that. He just he just grabs you and throws you straight into the you know, bubbling cauldron. And these are the kinds of countries that, that were involved in this extraordinary rendering. Now, the, the accusation is that uh, Diego Garcia became a kind of holding pen uh, for the people who were going to be rendered. And this, this accusation came uh, first from the Washington Post. And they also said that some of the prisoners on Diego Garcia were ultimately the ones who ended up in Guantanamo. Now, uh, at the time, the British Foreign Office strenuously denied this. But that's where it gets interesting, <laughs> because it was still British territory. Yeah? And admitting uh, that Diego Garcia was a stopping off point for extraordinary rendition or for uh, transport to Guantanamo would have made uh, the British government implicit, sorry, complicit in all of these activities. Yeah. There was one Liberal Democrat uh, MP who tried to bring it up in the House and uh, this was squashed in no uncertain terms. But then you had uh, Time magazine saying that Hambali, who was um, who, he was the guy who masterminded the Bali bombing in 2002, mm -hmm. they were saying he was being held on Diego Garcia. And then campaigners in Mauritius, who were trying to help the, the natives get repatriated, were saying members of Saddam Hussein's government were there uh, and that the whole place had essentially become Guantanamoized, is the, is the phrase they used, so that 
So, so what we have is um, definitely a holding pen for anyone the US didn't like and, and wanted to transport somewhere else so they, they could have, you know, electrodes attached to them. Uh, but so definitely that. But also in the intriguing possibility that some of the really nasty stuff was happening to people while they were still there on Diego Garcia. Isn't it terrible they take such a beautiful place, a place that you would just love to walk around and, you know, walk amongst the coconut trees and the, look at the beautiful um, crystal clear water and they turn it into something so terrible? Yeah, absolutely. That's the irony of it. It should be considered to be a tropical paradise, but, you know, history has, has taken it another way. Um, and your friend who has visited there is very lucky because the British government has tightly restricted visitors to the island. All he, was, um, he was actually in the military at the time, so uh, it, uh, it was so less of a pleasure trip, although he did say it was um, it was really beautiful, but uh, it was more because he was involved uh, during during the Iraq war. That explains it, because because uh, the British government tightly restrict visitors there. They ban all journalists are barred from Camp Justice, and a few people are allowed onto the island. But but the reports are that these visits are very carefully controlled. There's a kind of North Korea-like feeling to these visits, where you're constantly escorted around and shown what you you know you, you ought to see. Uh, I, just to, um, I just wanted to interrupt just quickly. What do you reckon would happen if a plane? flew uh, over there and, and maybe wanted to land there I mean if it was in trouble then I wonder how they would react to that situation I'm just I'm just speculating just a little and uh, tying it into the the disappearance of this plane well it depends um, I mean the theory the theory is that the plane flew there yeah it's a it's a five-hour flight so it would be within reach of the island they could fly there directly but the theory is that the island, uh, sorry, the plane actually flew to Male in the Maldives mm -hmm. and then flew on to Diego Garcia on the 8th of March in the morning. And there are witnesses that said that they saw a plane flying low over the Maldives. That's right, yeah, yeah. Um, in, the, in the morning, around quarter past six, uh, one of the passengers took a photo with his phone. Now, the photo is completely black. Uh, and, you know, there was speculation, perhaps the phone just kind of took the photo itself, you know, if, if it had been set to camera or, or the electronics of it had gone nuts after the plane crash, um, which would explain why the photo is black. But the other, uh, the other possibility is uh, revealed in his message. He sent a message, and the message said that he was blindfolded. Um, and wasn't really sure of what he was photographing. But photographs contain metadata, including the coordinates at which the photograph is taken, and those coordinates match the coordinates of Diego Garcia. In fact... Yeah, I, I read about that. What do, you, what do you personally think about that? I mean, where, who got this photograph? How did they get the photograph? Well, I'm assuming that the photograph was sent to a relative. That, that part I am not aware of. How, who did the photograph go to? I don't know. Uh, I am also not entirely sure that this metadata idea really tracks, uh, though it seems plausible to me. I don't think that uh, I don't think that's that's a very uh, contentious claim. I mean, even old cameras in the pre-digital era could give you an idea of where you were. Yeah, and your stock standard hundred dollar, two hundred dollar digital camera will tell you where you are. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I saw that, and um, my only slight concern was. When I when I saw it, it doesn't look like a photo. It lit in that had something occurred there, for example, it crashes near the island, or they they do um, they do allow it to land because it's it's having problems, or or they do want it to land because there's someone on board. Mm -hmm. Then the actual story that's released to the public is going to have to be completely hushed up. And they're going to have to um, create a cover story that like, well, maybe the planes crash. You lot go and look over there on an, in another part of the Indian Ocean. So yeah. in some ways for me, that's the, the fact they want to keep this island fairly out of the public eye would actually buy into the story. It would be interesting to know the length of the runway in Mali because uh, the 777 to land needs a runway of, I believe, at least 1,000 metres. And that's critical. If you have a, a plane that is in some kind of distress, 
the first thing the pilots will ask is where are the nearest airports and what are the length of the runways? If the runway in Male was quite long, then that puts a different complexion on it because it would mean uh, the pilots were probably not forced to land at Diego Garcia. If Male doesn't have the runway, then it could be the pilots had to come down in Diego Garcia. And then, yeah, what you're saying uh, becomes a lot more plausible. But, I mean, if you consider, for example, um, do you remember uh, there were British nationals held in Guantanamo and Australian nationals too, uh, and both prime ministers, Tony Blair and John Howard, were, were pressured, they were under considerable public pressure to go to George W. Bush and, and uh, ask for the release of their citizens from Guantanamo. Now, Blair and Howard both dragged their feet on that uh, continually. And the most widespread explanation for it was that they were just slavishly adhering to whatever Bush wanted to do. You know. But there was another theory around at the time, uh, in the British case, that if the Brits had been released from Guantanamo, uh, those guys had been sent there from Diego Garcia. And more explosive than their revelations about Guantanamo could have been the things they saw on that island in the Indian Ocean. So the Prime Minister was dragging his feet, this is a theory, the Prime Minister was dragging his feet because a British citizen who's been held on Diego Garcia, Garcia could say some massively embarrassing things about the British government. Surely when you've got a blindfold on, you can't see an awful lot. <laughs> well, true. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true, but at that stage, uh, at that stage, you know, the official theory was nothing's happening there. The the first uh, non-official theory was there people are being rendered from there to other places. But deeper than that, there was the idea that no, it's not only about rendering. Some seriously bad stuff is happening there. Uh, so, and and it's on British territory. This so it, this it, may be why. That, um, I mean, if you look on the internet, you can see. Um if you type in Diego Garcia and you type in the name of the plane MH370, you'll see mm -hmm. stuff coming up, but it's almost universally not mentioned in the in mainstream news in on CNN or CNN on BBC. Uh -huh. um, sometimes on some articles, I've seen it starting to appear in um in some newspaper uh, online newspapers, but it's not being mentioned at all. And so, may, I wonder if they've been told not to mention it. I think it's. I think it's possible. I think also. I think it's possible that a little self censorship comes into play. If you hear a name like this, then you, you're aware of how sensitive it is. You might decide, as a as a journalist in today's uh, in today's journalistic environment, to just maybe steer clear until things are a little uh, uh, a little clearer, and you know what the consequences might be if you mention it. I mean, most newspaper content goes through the editor. And as I've been talking about recently in, in previous episodes, um, Tony Blair was uh, was exchanging text, very uh, friendly text messages uh, to the editor of a national newspaper here, with kisses included. Um, mm -hmm. So you know they they do they do have a lot of control over the media in you know in our in our governments too. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely true, uh, and and I also think that. Uh, if you examine the culture of other countries uh, where the government has, let's say, punitive abilities, um, where the government can punish media outlets, uh, those country, in those countries the media starts to censor itself. The government can almost take their hands off after a while uh, because the media gets to know the things that they can't mention and just edits themselves. Uh, Turkey is a fantastic example of that. And if you... Uh, if you look, for example, at the reporting on the issue of the Armenian Genocide, uh, very often the facts have been covered up not because the government has asked journalists to do so, but because journalists have been trying to create in their heads theories about what the government would not like them to say and then not say that. And th this is actually a social phenomenon uh, not a social phenomenon, but a journalistic phenomenon that's been studied. Uh, it, and it goes back, probably even further, but it goes back at least to Nazi Germany, where 
Uh, a lot doesn't, of German... um, doesn't everything go back to Nazi Germany? <laughs> it does. <laughs> Even Fanta didn't know about that one. <laughs> I had heard something about it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, there was this concept in Nazi Germany of working towards the Führer. In other words, doing what you think the Führer would approve of. And, uh, and so the degree of censorship on the press in Nazi Germany was somewhat less than you would think because German journalists, like everybody else, were working towards the Fuhrer, and so the government didn't have to sense them. And I suspect there's a lot of that that happens in the British and American media these days. I think you're probably right. Um, OK, Anthony, thanks very much for, um, for joining us today and uh, for, for doing that bit of research for us. Um, I hope you'll come sure. back and uh, come back in the next episode or in, or in coming episodes if you're not too busy and, uh, and give us some research on other topics as well. No problem at all. Thanks very much for inviting me on. Thank you. I was going to go on and talk about the Illuminati today, but I think I might leave that um, for another episode because I think we're running out of time today. So I might leave that till possibly the next, next episode. I mean, so the sort of things that we're going to be talking about in the upcoming episodes are um, the global elite, population control, 9-11, the Illuminati, the Mothman, genetic engineering, as mentioned um, in other topics, in other episodes, sorry. Let me know what, um, what shows you've been listening to. And as I said, we're looking for a reviewer who can do that on the show. Um, no news commentary program will be complete without... Um, discussing finance, weather and sports. So I thought we could have a conspiracy uh, style um, finance, uh, sport and weather section maybe um, added to our audios in, in upcoming episodes. Not today so much. You know, we could talk about Bitcoin for the finance section. You know, is that going to be the electronic currency and, and uh, become the mark of the beast, which is mentioned in Revelations? Sport, you know, we could talk about things like the Brazil um, clearing up for the Brazilian World Cup, sending in army and helicopters. I think there was over like a thousand police and armoured vehicles that were sent in to clear up any criminal elements in Rio in the build-up to the World Cup. It's funny how they can get everything together um, and sort out some of these problems when they've got a big event like this and they can't do it normally. And it's a problem with a lot of our governments. They they do the bare minimum when in reality they could do a lot to solve some of the problems around us. I, I guess other sort of things we could cover in sports conspiracies are things like the Hillsborough inquest in the UK into the deaths of 96 football fans in, in 1989. Um, there was a, basically, there was an um, investigation into what happened there. It was basically... Um, people were killed because they were crushed in a crowd and it was kind of covered up basically that the police were partly responsible for this and they're going to be doing a new inquest into this and hopefully bring in justice to some of the the cover-ups that went on there and I guess in, th in the weather we can cover things like HARP weather modification system which is supposed to be able to control the weather and has possibly been actually causing some of the climate problems we've been having. We can talk about chemtrails, those trails that come out, um, that you, that people have started to see grids appear over city of trails, not behind, not the normal trails you see behind planes that sort of disappear after sort of 10 minutes or so. These are ones that linger for ages and there's whole grid-like patterns over cities now that some people believe are, um, possibly gases of some sort to sort of pacify people but also could just be um, for helping uh, with some kind of technology to helping the technology to work properly communications or something like that I mean there ha it has been mentioned by people like Al Gore he's mentioned chemtrails before and there's, they definitely do exist on some level. Whether they exist on a, on a sort of worldwide level, we, we need to find out. There's been a lot of scare stories this week um, to do with weather as well. Climate change really stepped up a level, basically to an almost apocalyptic level, saying basically um, 
our health, homes, food and safety are all likely to be threatened by rising temperatures. And we're all to blame for this, like inconsiderate use of deodorants and other aerosols. It's a wonder any of these are, um, anyone's got any deodorant or aerosols left after them being confiscated at security checks anyway. Now apparently it's us that are the problem, not the 2,000 nuclear weapons that have been detonated spread out across the world over the last 50 years. They, they haven't polluted our atmosphere or, or nothing to do with this incredible rise in cancer rates since that, that testing began. No, cancer, the cause of cancer is still unknown and there's no need to investigate that, of course. I'm being slightly sarcastic. I mean, the world, um, the, 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 the cancer rates in the world um, basically generate a lot of money through um, remedies that obviously don't cure it, but you know they still cost a lot of money, and they're going to make even more money because apparently, according to the World Health Organization, cancer rate is going to grow by 75% uh, by the year 2030. Some additional weather news. There's been an extreme amount of um, fear mongering going on regarding the weather in the last few days, really. To date, there's an article in the BBC website uh, talking about air pollution, high levels to spread across England, basically saying there's government health warnings, um, saying pollution has hit an incredibly high level and um, it's going to spread across the whole of England and that elderly people with um, any lung or heart disease are urged to stay indoors. I've never seen anything like this. I mean, it, it states that DEFRA has issued a, a ten-point um, warning measure for uh, this is a um, air quality measuring scale. Um, ten is the highest. Um, they're talking about some regions are going to hit eight or nine on this scale. Some even higher. And I've not seen anything like this. It just seems really, really strange to me. I thought I'd mention it. It says um, in the article on the BBC that people with asthma may find they need to use uh, their inhaler more often. Other, other older people should reduce physical exertion. It sounds really odd to me. And then it goes on to say it's important we don't get this out of proportion. To me, it sounds like they already have. Um, I mean, what's going on with our weather? I don't, personally, I don't buy into the idea that this is all man-made. I'm sure some of it may be. But if it is man-made, I don't think it's made by us. Where's this coming from? Is it Fukushima, maybe? Anyway, I thought I'd mention that and add that on to the, um, on today's, today's weather. Let me know what you think about that. All this uh, fear mongering regarding the weather. Are you getting the same locally to you? I mean, air pollution is apparently the uh, the single biggest environmental health risk according to the World Health Organization. And also, in the last few days, we've had lots and lots of news about climate change. A very apocalyptic sort of um, articles. So have you been getting the same way you, where you are? Let us know in the comments section actually what's going on. Anyway, just one last appeal before we sign off today. Um, we're looking for sponsors, people who can sponsor, uh, sponsor us to, so we can do more research into topics. Um, so if you happen to be very rich and you fancy um, sponsoring us, let me know. Um, also, we want to increase the listener base, so if you can help by just sharing these audios if you like them. And thanks, by the way, for I've had a lot of positive feedback. Um, it's really nice to get your feedback, you know. By all means, let us know ways we can improve. That's, that's good. We're always trying to improve, but thanks for all the positive feedback anyway. Thanks to, um, just want to say thanks to a few people. Kieran, who's going to be in uh, charge of our audio. Anything related to audio, Kieran's going to be responsible for. Um, Anthony, of course, our resident academic now. And um, hopefully some new people will be joining our team. Anyway, just a big thank you for listening.
please share us please help um, post this video on your Facebook page it's all free remember we don't get paid for anything here at the moment um, thank you very much catch you later